Warning, the following podcast contains dick jokes. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by the new evening after pill for abortionists that found God later that day. Plan C is for Christ. Did you get knocked up by accident and resort to plan B? Feeling guilty about defying the creator of the universe? Wish you could get some fresh semen back inside you without involving the father whose child you just killed. Don't worry, we've got the vaginal suppository for you. Plan C is for Christ, because reversing an abortion takes a lot of spunk. And now, the scathing atheist. Hi, I'm Dan Errol, author of Parenting Without God. And I can assure you that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. It's Thursday. It's September 10th. And it's officially wabbit season, duck season, and stat tracker season. Hell yeah, I'm No Illusions. I'm Heath Enright. And from Blazer Nation, Valdosta, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, we'll wonder why a city would call itself more head if they didn't want gay dudes there. An ex-girlfriend tells me I should probably get tested for spirituality. And author and screenwriter Chris Matheson will be here to point out that the Bible just might not be the perfect word of God after all. But first, the diatribe. I've been thinking a lot about the fire analogy that Ryan Bell used on the show last week, and not just because I'm getting six emails a day chastising me for not taking him to task on it a bit more. So for those of you who didn't hear that interview, my guest was a former pastor turned atheist who likened religion to fire in that it can warm your house, but it can also burn your house down, right? Like basically it's a tool that can be used for good or bad. Now, I I pointed out at the time that my biggest issue with that analogy is that unlike religion, fire is a necessary thing. Right. I mean, we actually need fire to accomplish many of the things that make our society function, but there's nothing that religion can do that humanism, philosophy, and science can't do without the inherent risk of burning down your house. So it's less like using fire and more like using a hammer that may or may not explode at any moment when there are other non-exploding hammers in the toolbox. Now, to his credit, Ryan agreed with that, but he elaborated a bit, and that's where the impetus for all these emails came from. So a quick point of etiquette, it's crazy rude to have a guest on one week and then spend a monologue the following week arguing with what he said when he's not there to defend himself. So for the record, I'm going to be passing along a transcript of this diatribe to Ryan, and if he feels the need to clarify or rebut anything I've said, I'm going to give him a chance to do so on the show because there are limits to my assholery. And now that I have all of that out of the way, let me argue with somebody who isn't here to defend himself. Actually, you know what? First, let me start by defending my guest, okay, because several emailers took him to task for what I consider the wrong reason. They argued that unlike fire, there are no benefits to religion. You know, so it's less like using fire and more like just telling yourself you're warm over and over again. And, and that's clever, but I think it's a bridge too far. It's, it's unrealistic to say that there are no benefits of religion. You know, I mean, I'll agree with you if you say that the benefits are always outweighed by the costs. Sure. Hell, I'll start a podcast to argue that point on a weekly basis. But it's hard to deny that some people take some benefits away from religion at some times. You know, I I don't want to overstate the case, of course, because the same can be said of basically everything. You know, meth addiction sucks, but in the long term, it'll probably save you some money on dental cleanings. Technically, that's a benefit. You know, but when people say there are no benefits to religion, I bristle a bit because not only is it technically incorrect, but it's damn easy for even a dull theist to disprove that through personal experience, right? So in that sense, I agree with what Ryan was saying. Religion is a tool that can be used for good and bad. Now, I don't think it's possible to use the good parts and not the bad parts, and I think that he was implying that with his argument, but that's way too minor to spend a whole diatribe going back to. My real point of contention comes from his historical perspective. And even if you didn't hear the interview, I'm sure you've heard this point made before. Yes, religion is an overall negative influence on today's society, but at a certain point in history, it served an overall positive function. And, of course, the segment of human evolution religion most often gets credited with in this analogy is morality. I have no idea why, to be honest. I I think it's much easier to make the case that religion served an overall positive historical role in terms of, you know, like formalizing education or universalizing writing or or improving international diplomacy. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I still think that those are all wrong. They're just easier to argue in favor of. But the idea that religion served an overall positive function in the development of morality is, not to put too fine a point on it, absurd. 
I mean, sure, if you segment the chunks of time just right, there are bound to be points you can look at, you know, where the graph is moving up, because that's true of all graphs, pretty much. But, but you know, look, if I exclude all the points where Bill Cosby was raping somebody, he's not a rapist either, you know? You're not allowed to do that. The fact of the matter is that religion has been and continues to be an overwhelmingly negative drag on moral development. The very idea of codifying moral dictates in such a way that renders them static is a definitional impediment to moral development, and almost all religions do that. Look, I mean, you know, I don't even care how good your rules are. You know, if if I wrote down 10 rules right now and convinced everyone that they were divinely mandated by God, and if you didn't follow them, you were going to go to hell, you know, I might ameliorate some moral quandaries in the moment, but the fact that they're immutable makes them an impediment to progress at some point. Divine moral dictates might help in enforcing the moral code of today, but they do so at the expense of the moral code of tomorrow. And if history has shown us anything, it's that tomorrow's moral code is almost always more appealing than yesterday's. Unless, of course, a whole bunch of people just got more religious. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is the Ted Theodore Logan to my Bill S. Preston Esquire, Heath Henry. (laughs) Heath! Are you ready to uh, sound extremely confused, like like a really good actor? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> At least I gave you the one that had a career after that. <laughs> anyway, in our lead story tonight, Kentucky's homophobe in chief Kim Davis was released from jail on Tuesday after accomplishing nothing except achieving international notoriety as an ignominious bitch. Good work with that. Davis, who served as Rowan County's clerk in the sense that she showed up to the office and collected a paycheck, had been held in contempt of court for refusing to do her job because she hates gay people so much. A lot. She vowed over the weekend to stay in jail, quote, as long as it takes, end quote, though she never said what the it referred to, so I'm thinking she meant as long as it takes to get the fuck out of jail. Yeah, as long as it takes to prevent zero gay people from getting married. Right. Mission accomplished. Just like a rock. Great job. Yeah. <laughs> Not so Lil' Kim. Doing fantastic work. <laughs> oh, come on. The fat jokes we're gonna make it in, No, that was people. an ugly come Lil' on, Kim joke. That oh, was an oh, ugly okay. Lil' Kim right, joke. Gotcha. It had nothing to do with the weight. Of course, by the time this is released, she might be back in jail once again, since the only reason she wasn't breaking any laws while she was in jail is because she was in jail. The (laughs) judge that freed her made it clear that the release was contingent on her no longer prohibiting her employees from issuing marriage licenses to gay couples, which she vowed to keep doing. So, eh. according to her attorney, Matt Staver, she won't be satisfied until the state laws are changed to remove her name from the certificate so that God won't think she's okay with the butt stuff. That's how it works, yeah. Yeah, because apparently God knows less about what's going on on Earth than the guy from Duck Dynasty. (laughs) So, she's asking for some other Christian person to get stuck going to hell because of their name on the gay paperwork? (laughs) Apparently, This all makes sense, yeah. (laughs) Now, upon release, Davis took time away from breaking James Conn's ankles with a sledgehammer to attend a rally on her own behalf. Present at the rally was deluded presidential hopeful Mike Huckabee, who seemed downright pissed that nobody was putting him in jail as well, seeing as how he hates gay people and loves God way more than this bumpkin. Huckabee said, quote, If you have to put someone in jail, I volunteer to go. Let me go. Lock me up if you think that's how freedom is best served. I do. Lock me up, tie me down, spank me like a naughty little schoolboy, <laughs> slap a saddle on me and ride me around the living room, oil me up and force me to lick ranch dressing off your balls. Just please, somebody <laughs> persecute my ass already. And and I don't know how much. Some of that wasn't a quote, but most of it was. Yeah, Christians are so jealous of that Holocaust. Mike Huckabee... <laughs> Mike Huckabee wants the Holocaust inside of him. He is <laughs> loving it. Us. Of course, Huckabee was far from the only public figure celebrating the equality America has achieved now that a woman can be George Wallace, too. Among the many Christian intellectuals rallying to her defense was YouTube preacher and man who can't pronounce a three-syllable word without breaking into a sweat, Josh Fierstein. Yes, it's Fierstein. <laughs> in a video awesome. released immediately after Davis was taken into custody, fat guy in a red hat that claimed that her arrest a was hat. a clear sign that, quote, the Christian Holocaust has officially begun, end quote. <laughs> Could have a kickoff. Party. Yeah, well, right, yeah, because as I'm sure you recall, the Holocaust began when the Jews decided to ignore the laws that said they couldn't stone non-virginal brides to death on their fourth father's doorstep, and and mostly consisted of putting extremely fat people in jail and then releasing them four days later, still just as fat. That was how the Holocaust worked. That was a fat joke, I think. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> and believe it or not, fat guy in a red hat wasn't the only person to mention that Kim Davis is exactly like a Jewish prisoner in Nazi Germany. No, he wasn't. Among others, her lawyer, Matt Staver, of the Liberty Council, had a similar astute comparison. According to Staver, quote, Back in the 1930s, it began with the Jews, 
where they were evicted from public employment, then boycotted in their private employment, then stigmatized, and that led to the gas chambers. This is the new persecution of Christians here in this country, end quote. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think it's clear from the Davis case here that we're on the verge of excluding the 71 percent of Americans that identify as Christian from all public employment, which means, among other things, we're going to need 86 new senators, 491 new congressmen, a new president, a new veep, new secretaries of state, the treasury, defense, the interior and all the other stuff we have secretaries for and a new AG just for starters. So I wasn't aware of this critical detail, but I guess the Jewish people were allowed to leave Auschwitz whenever they wanted, as long as they agreed to serve gay Nazis at their places of business. Yes, uh uh-huh. Which, of course, the Jewish people were unwilling to do because of the butt sex, and that's why millions of them died in the gas chambers. Just like Kim Davis will if she continues refusing to let the six gay couples in Rowan County, Kentucky, have her marriage license from her office. Right. Good thing we have lawyers like Matt Staver around to explain stuff you can't find in history books. Yeah, (laughs) I learned something today. But no scramble for exaggerated delusions of persecution is complete until end times pastor and post-chemotherapy version of Conan O'Brien Rick Wiles chimes in. (laughs) On his radio program on Thursday, Wiles warned that Davis's incarceration was an unmistakable sign that the last days are upon us. Quote, Kim Davis's imprisonment is only the beginning of the reign of terror by the Obamanista communist regime's gay stapo, end quote, (laughs) which officially marks the 5,000th thing that Wiles has identified as the first step of the fucking apocalypse. All right, but here's the thing. Listen, Obama's not just going to sit there as a gay, communist, atheist Muslim and do nothing. So either he forces all the Christians to have butt sex (laughs) or he dismantles capitalism. It's one or the other, so you guys choose. Can't have your cake and eat it, too. Kim Davis with a penis, Mike Huckabee, also had some words of wisdom for us. As often he does. Including a fresh new analogy. Awesome. Fearing the Holocaust comparison might be a little vague, you know, especially considering all the disagreement over the severity of that thing among his constituents. (laughs) Huckabee instead referenced the treatment of Muslim detainees at Guantanamo Bay. Uh Apparently those people were given prayer mats, halal meals, and prison cells with an arrow pointing toward Mecca. Therefore, they received better accommodation of their religion than Miss Davis, who was never told, I guess, what direction the sky was relative to her jail and therefore (laughs) couldn't contact Jesus directly. That's probably why she was in jail for so long. (laughs) But, of course, not all the crazy Christians were rallying to Davis' defense. The Westboro Baptist Church, perhaps pissed off that people were throwing rallies for this Johnny-come-lately when they were hating fags way before it was cool, launched an online campaign suggesting that gay marriage was, if you really think about it, Kim Davis' fault. (laughs) Well, if I was about to get gay married, I definitely want to fly to Kentucky so I can get an official Kim Davis signed marriage right. license for spite. Like, have it framed, tweet her pictures of it constantly. <laughs> Joy eternal damnation, bitch. Hashtag butt sex and tax benefits. Hell Suck it. Yeah. And of course, a quick gaze into her eyes would make fucking dudes look a lot better too. But the WBC centered their argument around the fact that Davis is an adulteress who has been married four times and had children out of wedlock, or rather had children in wedlock to people she wasn't wedlocked to. (laughs) Of course, Davis would defend herself by pointing out that she didn't drink the magic Jesus potion until her most recent marriage, so all the stuff before that never actually happened. But in an accidental demonstration of the value of standards of evidence, the WBC pointed out that the whole reason that God cursed America with marriage equality in the first place is because of all the sinful whores like her, Hmm. which is... No more or less true than any other religious argument. Sure, sure, why not? God made gays to get back at Kim Davis, and now he's going to smite us with hurricanes for having the gays that he cursed us with. Sounds like the guy from the book I'm reading, honestly. Yeah, I think they man-nailed that. (laughs) And in cruise control news tonight, GOP presidential candidate, U.S. senator, and guy whose immigration policy would have people like Ted Cruz deported Ted Cruz, decided to help thousands of churches violate federal tax law by sending them a sermon he wrote calling for the defunding of Planned Parenthood, requesting they read the statement to their congregations. In case anyone isn't familiar with the law I'm talking about, it's illegal for a tax-exempt organization to engage in political speech or interaction with legislative bodies. Right. And Ted Cruz, of the nation's highest legislative body, literally just sent them a political speech. So right. yeah. But Pretty much of textbook course, illegal. Upon hearing about this clear violation of the Constitution, the people who shelter and enable child rapists with impunity said, quote, yeah, 
sure wouldn't want to break any of your silly little laws. Unquote. <laughs> so looks like Cruz might be doing some early prep work for this year's upcoming Pulpit Freedom Sunday, right? which is an illegal tax evasion holiday that Christians invented in 2008 in which preachers send the IRS video evidence of themselves giving illegal political speeches. And here's a snippet from what Cruz wants them to say this time. According to his sermon, quote, when an individual or a nation stiff arms the character of God and embraces an abomination as the law of the land, it ends in disaster. Uh -huh. It is a very short step to dismembering the bodies of the most vulnerable, end quote. <laughs> and from there, it's straight to raping puppies while lubricating with the blood of panda babies. <laughs> and and then we, you move on to butt hamstring old ladies to death while shitting on disabled veterans, <laughs> and then listening to Mumford and Sons. It just gets worse and worse as you so go. That's, that's, yeah, that's absolutely. what I'm saying. <laughs> so Sounds like a fucking Mongolian throat singer at karaoke <laughs> night. I'm sorry, my wife loves this shit. I, I, just, I don't get it. So... Those two nice visual images we got from Teddy Fuckspin over there. Right. First, I pictured NFL running back Marshawn Lynch, a.k.a. Beast Mode, possessed by Satan, running down the field and stiff-arming God about 10 <laughs> yards backwards before trampling over the creator of the universe for a baby-killing touchdown. With a spike, of course. Obviously. And, of course, the other image would be an eight-month-old fetus getting pulled from a uterus with a fisherman's gaff and then getting drawn and quartered by four midget ponies. <laughs> Because that's what Planned Parenthood does. I'm sorry. Very lit, similar. Little person ponies, please. <laughs> that headline was in danger of being distasteful. Yeah, no, good. You saved it. And, of course, normally we would kick things over to Lucinda at this point, but she's been down and out for the last couple of days with a nasty cold, and she just couldn't make it tonight. She did, however, ask me to make sure everyone knew that the insanely disgusting story that she covered last week about the two sisters in India getting sentenced to being raped for their brother's affair has been called into question over the last week, and it now looks like it may never have happened, so... It's good to know that the world's rape capital can knock two off of their list. Yeah, great job. Uh, we did learn an important lesson, though. Fellas, if you get accused of raping a lot, India's the place to go. <laughs> World leader in the rights of the accused male. That's where you want to go. You hear us, Mr. Cosby? <laughs> and in the other kind of fantasy football news tonight, a pastor from First Baptist Church in Villa Rica, Georgia, performed a mass farcical aquatic ceremony in an effort to wash the demons off of that city's high school football players. The group baptism took place on school property before a practice, and among the participants was the team's head coach. Because, I guess, First Amendment violations are like syphilis. You know, once you got one, there's no reason to avoid getting more. <laughs> and, you know what, they're kind of like AIDS, too. You know, engineered by God as a solution to the gay process. <laughs> Useful. Luckily, the atheist bat signal was raised and the FFRF stepped in and reminded the coach that dunking your players into Christianity doesn't fall within the bounds of his job description and demanded that the practice end immediately. Now, for its part, the district has promised to investigate the claims and agrees that they're not allowed to do that shit. But despite the clear and unambiguous 239 years of consistent jurisprudence on this matter, the pastor involved couldn't help but wonder if this wasn't the same as being fed to a lion. <laughs> well... I think it's about time for the local Satanist chapter to show up and insist on dousing all the players with milk so they can put those demons back. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, we don't need homeless demons. Ridiculous. Now, in a statement where each sentence seemed to be competing for stupidest, Pastor Kevin Williams pointed out that in a free country, all people should be allowed to do all things. Quote, <laughs> what? We live in a free country. These people that are trying to say you can't do that, well, they're taking away freedom. And after yep. indignantly explaining how laws work, he went on to ask, quote, when did it become illegal to bow your head and pray? When did it become illegal to say, I'm a Christian, end quote? Oh. When it was explained to him, of course, that neither of those things have ever been illegal, he <laughs> nodded and said, yeah, I, I know, but I, I, if I actually say the thing I'm pissed off about, it's really obvious how wrong I am. So that makes it tricky. If you don't mind, I'm just going to pretend I, I'm religious. That's what we do. <laughs> that's that's kind of my specialty. And finally tonight, from the STDism file, Blue Mountain Community Church of Walla Walla, Washington, recently sent out some analog spam in the form of postcards advertising a series of lectures on the topic of spirituality and when it becomes toxic. Uh -huh. The mailings were printed with an image of the radioactivity symbol, along with the question, do you have a spiritually transmitted disease? 
which is exactly how I keep telling the Pew Forum to phrase the are you religious question on the religious <laughs> landscape survey. So it's good to see that somebody's <laughs> finally taken my advice on that one. <laughs> now, at first glance, I was thinking to myself, okay, you know, too much spirituality can definitely be toxic. Sounds like a good topic. Mm -hmm. This, you know, progressive, self-effacing church decided to discuss the idea that certain people might be getting a little carried away with the whole religion thing. Good stuff. But then I checked the church's website, and based on the information they provided there, I cannot imagine that's what happened. Instead, I'm pretty sure the so-called lecture series was actually a bunch of cautionary sermons warning against all those soft-ass Spinozan believers and the evils of non-fundamentalism. Now that sounds more like Christianity to Doesn't me. It? Well, either way, regardless of their intention, the Blue Mountain Community Church made it sound like they invited some expert theologians to debate the question, what debilitating diseases did the Virgin Mary contract besides Christianity when God raped her that time? Right. Which, of course, means we're going to need 30 seconds on the clock. Spiritually transmitted diseases. Obviously. Go. Um, uh, mad kowtow disease. <laughs> nice. <laughs> About colon cancers in Genesis. Oh, nice, nice. Let's, let's just hope. Um, the human popeloma virus? <laughs> that was Adam Reese gave me that one. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> About, um, in honor of our next Holy Babel segment, actually. What about hepatitis and syphilimon? <laughs> um, amyotrophic liturgical sclerosis or Pew Gehrig's disease? <laughs> that was kind of lame, sorry. <laughs> All right, well, uh, lots of Westboro Baptist Church people suffer from this next one. Um, picket rickets. <laughs> Problem for Fred Phelps later in life. How about um, acquired a mom deficiency syndrome? <laughs> How about pentagonorrhea? How about beast infection? <laughs> oh, nice. S similar to a urinary chick tract infection. <laughs> it's a slow burner. I like it. I like it. Uh, how about sudden infant depth syndrome? <laughs> That's a child raping joke there. <laughs> if, you, if you rape a little slower, it's, it's grids, gradual infant yeah, right. death syndrome. <laughs> All right, one more. Um, I heard this is a problem for Mike Huckabee and Pat Robertson, actually. Um, irritable jowl syndrome. Oh, nice. Can imagine that nice. Being, you know, a lot of shit flying right and out of that area. Now that we've made fun of Pat, the human pitch drop experiment, Roberts, I guess we can officially close out the headlines. Heath, thanks as always. Battleship. And when we come back, Chris Matheson will be here to help me speculate on God's sexual orientation. I'm thrilled to welcome our next guest to the show. Chris Matheson is an author and screenwriter whose screenwriting credits include Rapture Palooza, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and, of course, their subsequent bogus journey. He's also an accomplished director and the author of a new book titled The Story of God, a biblical comedy about love and hate. Chris, welcome to The Scathing Atheist. Uh, thanks. Nice to be here. So I have to warn you at first that I am a big fan of your work. Yeah, Bill and Ted came out when I was about 12 or 13, saw it with my best friend who was in the band that I was in that was going to be famous as soon as we learned to play our instruments. Uh, <laughs> this is the movie that introduced me to my single greatest comedy influence in George Carlin. I, just, I had a ton of reasons to love that flick. Um, now, obviously, I brought you on to talk about your new book, but I don't think I can make it all the way through the interview without at least one Bill and Ted fanboy question. So uh, do you mind if we just get that out of the way first? Not at all. Okay, so uh, this question is actually about the sequel, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Um, now, this was a movie that came along at about the same time in my life as I was being introduced to Douglas Adams, Kurt Vonnegut, Monty Python, comedy that you know treated religion with irreverence, if not downright mockery. And of course, in Bogus Journey, you have your characters going to hell, going to heaven, beating the Grim Reaper at Battleship, um, at the very least lightly lampooning a lot of Christian mythology in a PG franchise. Uh, so, especially after reading the story of God, I'm curious if there was any pushback from the studio on that, anything that you wanted to include in those parts of the movie but weren't allowed to? The movie was originally uh, titled Bill and Ted Go to Hell. Uh, that was what Ed and I uh, wanted it to be called, uh -huh. and that's what it was called, I think, even through production. And they backed off from that. And originally, we had a lot more in hell. They There was a... There, uh, adventure in, in hell, which they liked, which was frustrating to the demons um, and the devil because they're Bill and Ted and they right, were just right. getting excited and upbeat no matter where they are. And they, they were excited about the big rocks that they were sentenced to pound away at eternally. Um, so they were in hell more and they were in heaven more. And um, originally they were going to, the characters that were going to come back, you know, it, it 
<laughs> it ended up in a sort of out of left field comedic fashion that a Martian scientist is their accomplice in Act Three, which is, you know, bizarre, even when I think back on it. Right. It's kind of funny, but it's bizarre. Originally, it was going to be biblical figures. There's a draft somewhere where basically Moses and and Noah and uh, I, I don't know who else, uh, you know, Abraham are are there. They're the ones who come really? back in Act Three and are uh, accompanying them on their whole uh, doing, you know, whatever Moses parting cars on a freeway or something like that. Right, right. And and maybe that was a little bit too irreverent for the studio. I don't know. I don't I don't know why we ended up changing that or it might have just been honestly that they felt just like it felt like a repeat that they were historical figures again because oh, right, they kind of are. Right. They kind yeah. of just feel like historical figures. So, you know, let's throw a Martian in instead, I guess. But yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of the same interests that go that far back, sure. Mhm. All right, so let's turn to your new book, which, by the way, I'm also at risk of being pretty damn fanboy about. Um, <laughs> now, this is going to sound like bullshit to everybody who hasn't read the book, but I very literally laughed out loud before page one in this book, and I would challenge any of our listeners to make it further than that without at least a chuckle. Um, now, to be honest, I don't think that I could do the premise justice, so I'm just going to leave that to you. What is the story of God? I wanted to tell the story of this character from Genesis to Revelation. I wanted to follow him on his whole emotional journey and see if I could piece together a character who made sense to me. I was for a variety of reasons, sort of drawn to the Bible I, from a comedic standpoint. It, there's a lot of really great found comedy in the Bible. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite funny to me. As long as you don't take it seriously. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, if you take it seriously, I don't understand that. I, I, I find that kind of hard to grasp myself, but I, at a certain point, thought, I want to try to get inside this guy's head, or at least be on his shoulder, and make sense of him. Who, his behavior is so bizarre, he's so volatile, he's so horrible and destructive and 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 strange and and hard to understand. He's just kind of all over the map. He seems deranged, and then and then he he gets a little bit nicer at times, and and I. And I wanted to try to find a coherence to it. What, what is the deal with this guy? What is wrong with this guy? What is motivating this guy? Why, why does he do the stuff that he does? So that was, that was the um, uh, impetus for writing the book. And, and so what did you learn about God? What, what, is the, uh, what are the, the threads that tie him together? Well, I think that there's uh, an underlying... I think there's three ways of looking at him. And uh, one of them is he's just kind of a fraud. He's kind of the Wizard of Oz. He doesn't really have all the power that he says he does. He's just kind of a big fake. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of funny. I, I find, and there, and there is certainly evidence in the book to, to back that up. The second is he's kind of a fool. He, he does have all the power, but he's really not that bright. It's sort of a universe created by a guy who has an IQ of 98. You know, he just makes a variety of boneheaded decisions and then he gets mad at himself and frustrated and you know basically you know kicking the ground like and and move and and tries again and makes another stupid mistake and then the third one which i think is the most compelling and the and and the most um deeply rooted in the text is that he's he's a freak he's there's something deeply self-hating about mm -hmm. this character uh he hates us we're made in his image he pretty much hates all of us and we're even the ones you know, he likes, yeah. Yeah, even the ones he likes, he hates. He hates, I mean, arguably, given the way he punishes them, you'd say he hates them most of all. I think, I think there's a deep, uh, self-hatred. And I, th I ended up feeling a, a weird kind of, um, sympathy for this character at a certain point because I uh, thought, what a horrible reality right. that is. If you play it out, what a, what a really, excruciating loneliness there is to this job, right? I mean, there you're all alone. You have no friends. You have no mother. You right. have no father. You have no siblings. You have, you know, your son, suppose you never even really meet him and you've basically murdered him. You know, <laughs> that's like, hey, son, nice to meet you. You know, I just tortured and killed you, basically. A rough icebreaker, yeah. 
Yeah, and so you're never touched. You can't be touched. You can't have any contact. And you have one, you have no friends, but you have an enemy. You know, you have one enemy. That's it. That's all you've got. And, uh, I think that it sort of drives him mad. I think there's a sort of an incipient mental illness almost from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And it comes to full fruition in Revelation where you just think, wow, th- this guy's gone, man. This guy's gone this guy's blown out he's a he's a complete um james bond villain at this point right right now one of the things that i loved about it is just by making uh god into a uh repressed self-loathing homosexual you explain so much about the book yeah you know to the degree that god has a sexuality Mm-hmm. And of course he does, right? I mean, he's a male. We know he's a male. I mean, that's, that's stated. Mm-hmm. And he's very interested in sex. It's not like he never talks about it. It's not like, you know, it's not like, no, that's, that's beneath him. No, he talks about sex a lot. He's very, very interested in sex. And, and balls in particular. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Penises and balls. It, he's very particular about how he wants them to look. And he's very particular about perfect balls. Perfect balls. Man. <laughs> balls have to be just absolutely perfect. And he's got a very specific idea of how penises should look. And, you know, he's all, he's all over that stuff. And, and no interest in women, right? Mm-hmm. Women are just kind of gross. You know, like women are just sort of, uh, they're icky. And he, you know, that's just, they're unclean. They're, and, and then when you get into sort of his, his taste, it's really queeny. I mean, he really does have kind of queeny taste when he starts talking about what he wants his temple to be. All the little cherubs in the purple fabric that he wants everywhere. Yeah, yeah, pomeg- yeah, uh-huh. yeah pomegranate right. blue fabric and gold balls. And it's just like, wow, man, you you get really, really gay taste. And then as any really uh, deeply repressed homosexual does, I think – he hates homosexuals. Mm-hmm. He hates homosexuals. Oh my God, he hates homosexuality. I mean, the whole Sodom thing is just craziness because he never even said homosexuality was wrong up to that point. He never said a word. Right. He just nukes them. <laughs> and the women too. Yeah. Like, what's the deal, man? What are you doing? They're like, are the women all lesbians? I mean, he doesn't give a shit if they are or not. He doesn't care. Right. He doesn't even bother to know their names of the, uh, of the women that play pivotal parts in his story. No, never. No. I mean, so few women even get, I mean, even Eve, even Eve, yeah. God doesn't, God doesn't give a name to <laughs> fucking Eve, you know, Adam has to name her. He just calls her woman. Noah's wife doesn't have a name. Of course, Noah's sons have names. Mm-hmm. Noah's wife, she's kind of an important character, right? No, I guess not. She doesn't get a name. I, I thought one of my favorite moments in the book was a, a very subtle bit in there where uh, he's when he goes to visit uh, Abraham and forgets his wife's name, starts calling her Rachel, and uh, even though her name is clearly Sarah elsewhere in the book. Yeah. That's one of those things that I guess if you know the Bible well enough uh, – uh, is is really going to hit you a lot. And I guess that that leads me right into my next question is uh, how familiar were you with the Bible going into this? Well, I was I, I read it I think in my 20 late 20s because I because I just wanted to because I was curious and I it you know, it definitely struck me. I thought it was pretty interesting. And then I picked it up again uh probably about 5 years ago. And this time it hit me hard and I thought, wow. Yeah. Wow, this is incredible. This is an amazing book. And if you like comedy, man, you have just stumbled onto the ultimate gold mine because it's so, it takes itself so seriously, right? You know, that's what, that's what makes it really funny. Mm. Like, this isn't funny. This isn't funny. You shouldn't laugh at this. Uh, this is dead serious. This is truth. Capital T truth. Of course, that's what makes it really funny. Right. And it's filled with utterly ridiculous, unfathomable behavior by, uh, by God and some funny human characters too. But I, I wasn't that familiar with it, uh, up until about five years ago. Now, I, I might be cheating a bit here because I might already know the answer to this, but was there one particular part of the Bible that you were most looking forward to, uh, like reinterpreting? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I adore the book of Job because, um, it's, well, it, it's, generally perceived or commonly perceived to be this crown jewel of the Bible, right? That Mm -hmm. it's this beautiful, poetic, deeply insightful, 
work that 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 gets at the roots of you know uh, good and evil and it's a theodicy and and it's like why do bad things happen to good people and of course none of that's true the book of job is 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 absurd i mean he's the god of the book of job he's a character really worthy of of swift or voltaire i mean they could not have written this guy better because he's a, he's a bully he's a braggart he's a lightweight uh, he's incredibly shallow and mean. The whole thing is just basically a party bet with Satan. Right. You know, why do evil things happen to good people? Well, because God makes a party bet. <laughs> Satan, that's why. And and then most fascinatingly and hilariously, he has a complete nervous breakdown at the end. Like somehow the knowledge that he's lost this bet, because he clearly does lose the bet, right. makes him flip out. And he just starts talking a bunch of crazy shit in the end about his pet sea monster and <laughs> unicorns and how lightning talks to him. And, you know, it's just beautiful. It's okay. absolutely beautiful. Uh, my co-host describes that as God's drunken stepfather rant. And uh, yeah. <sighs> absolutely wow. bizarre. Now, one of the things that I loved the most about the book was that the narrative didn't just incorporate the contradictions and moral atrocities of the Bible. It, it, in a lot of ways, the narrative actually rose out of those things. That that actually informed it. And I thought you did a brilliant job weaving together some of the most absurd passages, but it, it also left me wondering if there was anything that you wanted to squeeze in from the Bible, but it just wouldn't fit into your narrative? <sighs> Good question. Good question. I... I wanted to get all of the stuff that I thought was the funniest. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of what I went for. Uh, I, and everybody cherry, you know, the Bible, everybody who reads it because it's such a massive book, depending on what they're looking for, they cherry pick, right? That's, that's what you do. You cherry pick. Right. And the cherries that I was picking were the funniest bits. So did I have to leave out any really, you know, maybe early on, um, Genesis, has been gone over. I wrote a lot about the Garden of Eden, uh, the Garden mm -hmm. of Eden and, and the serpent and how ludicrous that is. And, and to some degree, that's ground that's been gone over a decent amount because it's so early in the book, I think. And so I trimmed that way back. I mean, I could have gone on for 15 pages about that thing because it's, because it is sort of the beginning of the weirdness. Like why, what kind of freak has a big plan? A beautiful, a perfect plan, and then right at the very beginning introduces their own worst enemy into it and lets them fuck it up. Like, what is what? What right. is wrong with you? Now, yeah, I did notice that it seemed like on those 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 parts of the Bible that had really been picked over by comedians before, you 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 just kind of did. A, a, a very little on like things like Noah's Ark and the Ten Commandments and how bizarre those are. Of course, you obviously brought those up in the book, but didn't dwell on those as much. And I assume that that was why, because so many other comedians had been to that ground before. Yeah, that was why. That was why. Because I thought, well, you know, this has been, th these bits have been looked at quite a lot. And, um, you know, Ricky Gervais has, has, uh, he's fantastically funny. And, uh, his, his bits about, uh, Noah's Ark mm -hmm. and, uh, the garden are spectacularly funny. Um, like they'll make you cry with laughter. They're so funny. But, you know, people have done that. So, yeah. So I, so I, 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 I went a little bit lighter on right. that stuff. Uh, I could have done a lot more on that stuff because I think they're really funny bits. But Right. Now, I, I do want to say, just if, if anybody's curious just how absurd the Bible is, uh, Chris was looking for the funniest moments in the Bible to create his book and didn't even have to use the talking donkey from Numbers. So if, <laughs> if that's any indication. Uh, so what would you say is your, was your biggest challenge in writing this book? I think the challenge is uh, making his emotional journey uh a journey uh creating a narrative that's not monotonous mm -hmm. that's not super repetitive like he just does the same shit over and over and over again he kind of does but trying to find the arc of it trying to find the evolution of the story of his character um that that took some time because looked at a certain way it's like he just does mean shit from beginning to end. You know, he's right. just constantly punishing people. That's that's it. He just wants to punish. So that that took a little bit of of thought. Yeah, I, I was really impressed with the way because, you know, obviously, like you said, the Bible just offers you up so much humor on a silver platter. But I think you took a lot more than is just, you know, there easily for the taking. I, I was really impressed with the way that the story did become 
a story, because that's one thing that you absolutely can't say about the Bible. There's nothing cohesive about that at all. And trying to weave all that together in one story arc is, is a very impressive feat. It's not, co- it, no, it's not cohesive. And, and he, that was kind of the challenge. Like, how does, how to take this character? And it's his book. I mean, clearly he's the star. Of course he's the star. He's God. It's his, it's his story. But he's, it's not obviously coherent. And, uh, I, I wanted it to be. I wanted to, I wanted it to track. I wanted mm-hmm. it to feel like, Right. This makes sense that he would go from point A to point B to point C and get more and more upset, more and more troubled, more and more his his sort of mental illness kind of spinning out and the story of Job kind of haunting him because he knows what a complete idiot he made of himself and the, his his sort of deterioration culminating in uh, basically the end of, of the Old Testament, mm-hmm. basically ending with you know Babylon getting burned to the ground and him sitting up in the sky and blustering, I'm just about to do my thing, get out of the way, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, and then he does nothing. He does right. nothing, you know. That that's that's an amazing moment. I mean, the the ending of Jeremiah is not necessarily the funniest thing in the book, but it is the most stark, yes, uh, kind of abrupt gut punch in the whole book, I think, because he's it's just all talk, 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 and then suddenly it ends, and you get this kind of cold clinical finale where some other writer steps in in place of Jeremiah and says, effectively. None of this happened. Right. Like a, like a psychiatrist talking about a mentally ill patient. None of this happened. Yeah. And, and so that's the end. That's the end of the old, the old Testament story. And then I thought, okay, um, so now it's plan B. I, I got to try something else. I got to pull back and heal for a while. That didn't work. I'm going to try plan B with my son. And, you know, of course, plan B doesn't work either. And, and, um, none of it's going to work. You know, if plan C is, uh, Islam, you know, talking to Muhammad, well, that's not going to work either. And if plan D is talking to Joseph Smith, well, that's not going to work either. None of them are going to work. You right. know, it's never going to work. Now, I, I have to say, I, you know, as I was going through the book, because of the way that you built the narrative, you actually skipped over Job and sort of went back to it at the end there. I was, yeah. I was terrified we were going to miss out on his, on that, that speech. No, never. <laughs> so happy when we, uh, when we came back for that one. But I wonder if you think that a, a religious person can read this book and still find all the humor in it. Uh, uh- could a uh, Christian read this book and find it funny? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, I would like to think so. I think it would depend on the Christian. I mean, s- some of them would be very um, presumably angry and upset and want to send me, a, you know, a death threat or something. But it is their book. I mean, that's why I'm citing passages so frequently because I did want to kind of make it clear, like. This, this is your book. I'm not making up most of this right. stuff. This, this is in the Bible. I'm, I'm making up very, very little here. I'm connecting the dots, but I'm not making up very many things at all. Um, and I'm not making up any of the really, truly ludicrous things. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, maybe a certain kind of Christian, I, what my fantasy would be, a certain kind of Christian who's young mm-hmm. could read it and go, Oh my. God, I've had these doubts and these feelings before, and I couldn't admit them to myself, but mm-hmm. it is ridiculous. You know, how it is absurd. It is a ridiculous book. It is a ridiculous story. Come on. Now, it's possible that my own personal biblical lampooning experience is coloring my assumptions here, but would you care to preemptively respond to the people who will say that you just shouldn't make fun of people's faith, that that's sacrosanct and, and, and <laughs> off the table? Well, I mean, number one, obviously, nothing's off the table Amen. at any time. Nothing's off the table. Um, and the more that you position yourself as something that cannot be made fun of, the more you are drawing the attention of those who want to make fun of things. Uh, the more you forbid uh, any mockery of your belief system, mm-hmm. the more you're effectively demonstrating the necessity of making fun of your belief system i would say yeah that's it's it's, it's, it's a silly it's 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 a silly argument why why should we what does that mean to us we don't we don't we don't agree with them we're not being blasphemous we, we don't we don't believe in their story we think their story is ridiculous it's we're totally free to make fun of it as much as we want mm-hmm. 
And obviously, as you prove in the book over and over again, there's a lot to make fun of in there. There's a lot to make fun of. Yeah, there absolutely is. Well, I, I'll tell you what, man. I got to thank you for a really great read. And it's going to sound like I'm blowing smoke up your ass when I say this, but I honestly have not laughed that much at a book uh, since we lost Douglas Adams. I, I, I was literally reading this book through tears of laughter. Really appreciate it. Phenomenally funny. That's great to hear. Thank you very much. And of course, if you'd like to pick up a copy of Chris's book, and trust me, you would. Again, the t- uh, the title is The Story of God, a comedy about love and hate. It's available as an ebook, a hardcover, or as an audiobook, and we'll have links to all three formats in the show notes for this episode. That's episode 134 at scathingatheist.com. Chris, thanks again for joining us tonight. My pleasure. After God's drunken stepfather rant from Job came up multiple times in our conversation, I asked Chris if he'd allow me to share a quick excerpt from that portion of his new book, to which he graciously agreed. Now, if you'll recall, after Job had been raked over the coals repeatedly and then bitched out mercilessly by his friends, God appears to the assembled crowd of Job and his buddies ostensibly to explain himself. But what transpires instead is a tirade so insane it would make Ezekiel blush. So the following selection corresponds to Job 39.22 through Job 41.14 and comes from chapter 20 of The Story of God, where we join God's schizophrenic harangue already in progress. To say this was going badly would have been a colossal understatement. It was a disaster. The five men were staring up at the sky with baffled and, to be totally honest, vaguely concerned looks on their faces. God had lost the wager with Satan badly. Now he was losing a lot more. He knew that, but he couldn't seem to stop it from happening. Don't get started about ostriches and horses, God, he warned himself, but it was no good. Ostriches are idiots, he yelled. They are so stupid they don't even fly. No, ostriches don't fly because they can't fly. I know that. Horses cannot be frightened, God thundered. The men looked up at him confused. Horses love battle. They say aha because they love it so much. Job 39.22-25 I know nothing about horses. That's completely wrong. Job gave him an opportunity to escape this mess. He groveled on the ground and begged for mercy. I am nothing, God, he whimpered, Job 44. Good, I can stop now, God thought to himself. Job has been chastised. This can and should end now. God paused for a moment, then realized he wasn't through talking. He had more to say. So Job had more or less begged for mercy. Well, his answer was no, no mercy. How dare you question me? He found himself screaming again. How dare you question my justice? Have you a thundery voice like God's? Job 49. The third person thing sounded ridiculous, he suddenly realized. Who talks about themselves in the third person? Pretentious idiots. God's mind was spinning. He thought he was about to pass out. He was talking really fast. He he thought his voice sounded high and shrill and panicky. God wanted to stop talking. He really did, but the words continued to pour out of him, loud and frantic. He caught a glimpse of himself in a mirror. He had a mad, feverish glitter in his eyes. Some angels were backing away from him. Now, oh no, God started to talk about Behemoth, the sea monster, and instantly, instantly he knew this was a terrible idea. He found himself talking about Behemoth on occasion before, usually after too much wine, and thinking back, he felt he'd always sounded too excited and emotional. God had given Behemoth a name, Leviathan. Does Leviathan talk to you? Could you eat him if you wanted to? Could you stuff him with metal if you wanted to? Could you catch him and make him your pet? Could you tie him up so your little girls could play with him? Job 40.15-31 What am I saying? What does any of that even mean? Though he wasn't sure why, God suddenly felt extremely protective of Leviathan. Touch him and I'll kill you, he screamed. Job 40.32 I'm not making any sense. I'm flailing. This is excruciating, yet I cannot stop. God was sweating profusely now, trembling. His mouth was dry, yet spittle was flying as he yelled. He wondered if he was losing his mind. If somehow this tiny little wager with Satan was going to undo him completely. I'm a fraud, screamed his mind. I'm a bully and a coward and a weakling. I'm a sexually confused and frightened little man, desperate to cover that up by threatening and berating. But they see what I am. They always have. That's why they don't like me, not even the ones who do. God's mind searched frantically for a way out of this awfulness. Should he stop talking? No. Impossible. He was in too deep. Now he had to continue. I can still win this bet, he told himself. It's not too late. I'm God. I can do anything. I'll pull myself out of this by... Hmm. Continuing to talk about Leviathan. 
Who can remove his clothes? God howled. Who can pry the folds of his jowls apart? Who can open the doors in his face? Job 41, 5 and 6. The five men stared upward, clearly befuddled. Those were odd questions. God knew that. The point he was trying to make was, I can handle Leviathan, can you? But the, the doors in his face thing sounded bizarre. Also, Leviathan didn't wear clothes, obviously. He's a, he's a whale dragon. I, I must scare the humans, God thought. I can still do that, and I will. Leviathan can breathe fire, Job 41.13. He sneezes lightning, Job 41.10. He has a big neck, Job 41.14. God stopped, suddenly exhausted. The men were staring at the ground, now clearly embarrassed. God noticed a group of angels nearby looking at him worriedly, and then something caught his eye behind them. A flash of black. Fifty feet away, near a tree, Satan looked at him. He didn't smile, he didn't do anything, he just looked at God, who knew at that moment that something important had changed between them. We weren't testing Job, suddenly crossed his mind. We were testing me. It's time for the part of the show that comes next, listener feedback. This is the part of the show that we've kind of been meaning to catch up for for the last couple of weeks, and we really haven't had a chance. And, and here we go. Time. Our first message comes from Mark with a C, who writes, quote, First, god-awful movies, thanks. Second, also thanks. Third, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure where he was going with that, but uh, he explains, I didn't want it to go to your head. Speaking of which, I didn't use enough big words. Diffiomorphism, bitch. <laughs> it's actually quite interesting. The morphism and such. End quote. Yeah, I, I, I like some of their early stuff. They <laughs> kind of fell apart. No, he makes a good point. Love me some isomorphic smooth manifolds. I was Fuck yeah. just about to say that, too. We also got a message from John who wanted to kind of come to Josh Duggar's defense. It was a pretty long email, but basically he asks if we're not missing the larger point when we make jokes about Duggar like being an ancestral pedophile. He points out that Josh Duggar is a victim of an insane and sexually repressive upbringing, that his molestation days are behind him as far as we know, and that he shouldn't be tarred and feathered today for something he did when he was 14. And I I'm leaving a lot of the nuance out here, but suffice to say, John was very clear that he wasn't trying to excuse Josh's actions so much as question our decision to publicly demonize him over it. Uh, he concludes the email, quote, I'm not as clever as you guys, but I think throwing this dude under the bus for his actions is too easy and really misses a bigger issue. Hmm. Well, I, I agree that throwing Josh Duggar under the bus is extremely easy. No mm -hmm. question. Yeah, yeah. But so is making myself orgasm. I mean, easy <laughs> can be fun and productive. Right. Yeah. Who wants high-hanging fruit, you know? <laughs> giant pain in the ass. The low-hanging stuff, it, it tastes the same. Now, there is a really good point underlying this email because all religious people are, to one degree or another, victims of their faith. You know, when they grow up and pass it along to the next generation, they're expressing that victimhood. So if the enemy is religion, why pick on the victims, right? But look, a, a person who grew up getting beaten by their father is much more likely to beat their children, but we can still demonize the actions of that person and make Adrian Peterson jokes, for example. And we should, because part of what informs the actions of people raised in these religious circumstances are the social norms that we, as members of their society, enforce through shame. Okay, well, listen— I'm with you on most of the stuff you just said, mm -hmm. but you do not, you do not demonize a first round fantasy pick <laughs> mere <laughs> days after drafting him. I'm yeah. quite certain those kids were being uppity and deserved. <laughs> I mean, this guy, this guy rushed for almost 2,000 yards his last season. They must have been kind of uppity. We, we've got the uh, child beater and the rapist on that team. Now, look, if you dig down deep enough into determinism, it gets really hard to blame anyone for anything. So, you know, look, we make fun of religious people for a living, so when a guy who literally earns his paycheck by telling other people that he's more sexually moral than them, and then he gets caught fondling his sisters, cheating on his wife, and paying porn stars for rough sex, the guy deserves to be shamed. You know, if if Bill Nye was on Ashley Madison and fucked porn stars for money, I'd have no issue with that at all. Hell, I'd watch the video, but that's because <laughs> Bill Nye isn't going around telling everybody who they can and can't fuck. And that's right. We're talking to you, Mia Khalifa. <laughs> Threesome with Bill Nye and Salman Rushdie. Make it happen. I think Valerie Dodds is still the official porn actress of, of The Scathing Atheist because, if I'm not mistaken, she still comes up as a suggested Google search when you, when you check out our show. Really? But, but the issue that I ha that I really take with this email isn't the notion that throwing Duggar under the bus is too easy. He's right. 
You know, acting like Josh Duggar is some kind of anomaly in the Christian universe is complete bullshit. You know, they watch porn and cheat on their spouses and sexually abuse the women in their family way more than the average non-religious person. The disagreement I have with John is that by so doing, we're missing the larger issue. I mean, I think we're highlighting the larger issue through one of that issue's most visible poster children. And more generally, the Duggar story was surrounded by an entire podcast about that bigger issue he's talking about. Well, yeah, right, right. Now, I should also note that John specifically asked at the end of the email that we not make fun of him. Which comes on the heels of a listener asking us not to yell at him on the last feedback we do. So I, I'm afraid we might be setting the wrong tone with his feedback. John's segment. father smelt of elderberries. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. And I didn't mean to yell. I, I don't. He, he might have. I, I, I'm not. I'm not like putting my chip quite down certain your mother's not way. a hamster. And finally, we got a message from Rick, who actually sent his commentary in the form of an audio clip. So let's give him a quick listen. Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, Terrible thing to do to the people who pay my bills. But we, we missed a story a couple of weeks ago about the Foo Fighters rickrolling the Westboro Baptist Church, and a listener named Tom thought that we deserved a rickroll for that, so I'm just, I'm passing it along. <laughs> yeah, this was a fantastic story. Uh, apparently, it really was, yeah. a bunch of WBC protesters came out for a recent show in Kansas City to remind concert goers which people God hates. Evidently, it's still the gays and the Jews. Yeah, oh yeah. So in response to these assholes, the band pulled up in front of the bigot party with a truck full of speakers and gave them a good astly blasting. They love that. So in honor of the Foo Fighters and their award-winning Rickroll, we'd like to present this week's top ten. Ideas for the Westboro Baptist Church theme song. All right, all right. So I, I guess we got to start with a Foo Fighters remake. So how about number ten, Incest of You? <laughs> At number nine, you're a grand old fag. And God hates you. <laughs> yes, he does. Uh, I, number eight, Lady in Red State. <laughs> number seven, the birth of a national anthem. Uh, number six, you gotta pick it when they dick it. <laughs> That's not based on anything. I just, I, that would be a good song. That's all. <laughs> At number five, Sweet Child O' Mine Kampf. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, number four, uh, I get by with a little Phelps from my Fred. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> At number three, Ain't no mountain high enough. Nice. To nice. Keep us from getting to Jew babies. <laughs> Damn. Crack them eggs. You killed what it. That, that, that's way better than my number two. I, I just had, I had a highway to Heil, and no, that's no good. <laughs> Yours was way better. And at number one, turkey hotline in the straw. <laughs> and by the way, that number for the turkey safety hotline is not 785-273-0325. No, it is. Actually, you no, know what? Not. Fuck it. That's their theme song. 273-0325. Oh, three, two, five, five, five. Five. Well played. Yeah, nice. <laughs> and that's all the feedback you get. If you want more, keep sending us those emails, tweets, and Facebook messages. You'll find all the contact info on the contact page at skatingatheist.com. Before we hop back into the phone booth tonight, I wanted to offer a quick shout out to Jeremy Bean, Dave Fletcher, Justin Schieber, and Dr. Professor Luke Galen, formerly of the Reasonable Doubts podcast. They recorded their final episode a few days ago after years of well-researched, well-edited, and well-presented counter-apologetics. And on behalf of myself and the many other atheist podcasters that they've inspired along the way, I want to thank them for all the work that they've done. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you today. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be sure to check me out on not one but two episodes of The Imaginary Friend Show, number 285 and 286, I do believe. Of course, it's just not an episode until I thank Heath Enright for bringing his A game so often that I don't even know if he has a B game. I want to thank Lucinda Illusions because even when she doesn't appear on the show. She's always a huge part of putting it together. Also want to thank Dan Arrow for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. I should mention that his book, Parenting Without God, has just been re-released by a new publisher. It's been expanded and prettied up quite a bit, so if you meant to pick up a copy when he was on our show before, your procrastination might just pay off for you this time if you pick up a copy now. And speaking of picking up copies, I honestly can't recommend Chris Matheson's new book highly enough. Really enjoyed it, and if you too would like to enjoy it, I encourage you to follow the links on the show notes for this episode, if for no other reason than I want that dude writing more books. But most of all, of course, I need to thank this week's hottest hominids, Brad Lloyd, Caleb, Danny, Rebecca, Nathaniel, Helga, Chris, David, Mike, Lisa, and Milton Machine Repair. Brad Lloyd, Caleb, and Danny, who could only wear a cock ring if you count Einstein rings. Rebecca, Nathaniel, Helga, and Chris, who definitely would have figured out that both cups had Iocane powder in them. I mean, come on. And David, Mike, Lisa, and Milton Machine Repair, who are so classy, their whoop-ass has to be uncorked. 
Together, these 12 selfless hellbound heathens have helped us hold the holy homophobes accountable for their heinous and hateful haranguing this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the impeccable taste in fine wines and cheeses that it takes to give us money, but if you think you're up to the challenge, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist. And if you'd like to help with the Illuminati might find you if you make an online financial transaction, you can also help us a ton by leaving a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere else you're allowed to leave us five-star reviews. You should also probably like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter just to be on the safe side, too. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. All the music used in this episode was written and performed by yours truly, and yes, I did have my permission. There once was this fellow named Astley, who peopled my inbox steadfastly. He won't give me up, let me down, say goodbye, or run around, which is a shame, as his music is ghastly. You see what happened there? You, you stuck around too long, and you done got limerick rolled. Ah, limerick rolled! Oh, shit. <laughs>